Um, yes, got it. All right, so today I'd like to talk a little bit, I'm gonna start off talking about Enceladus and what Cassini told us about Enceladus. And then I'll talk a little bit about future studies that um, uh, Enceladus is inspired for uh, at Europa. We hope we can carry these out. As you can see, there are a list of individuals here uh, that have directly participated in material that's presented in this presentation. And I um, want to thank them all for their help. Next slide, please. So um, Cassini, which was launched in 1997, was one of the most success successful international um, space missions that we've ever had. It, as you can see, it had the participation of many different countries and uh, it had a European Space Agency five probe that went to Titan, as well as the Saturn orbiter. And I'll talk about instruments on board the Saturn orbiter today, particularly the ion neutral mass spectrometer and the cosmic dust analyzer, both that can had mass spectrometers as part of their instrument. Next slide. Okay, starting with Enceladus. Enceladus is a very small moon. Its diameter is only like 500 kilometers. Uh, it's got a density that uh, indicates it's both water and rock. And it um, has a very high surface albedo. So it looks very bright and a mean surface temperature that's about 75 Kelvin. You can see on this where um, it's located in the Saturn system. Enceladus, in fact, is right in the center of the E-ring, and it is the source of the E-ring, as we found out fairly clearly from the Cassini mission. Next slide. One of the extremely surprising things was that when we first started looking at this moon, we saw these fractures in the southern polar cap region, and um, th these that there was gas outflowing from this. The gas was pushing out ice grains that we could see as, as plumes in the visible in the infrared. Uh, you can look at the thermal infrared, which is the center picture, and you can see heated and elevated stripes that became known as the tiger stripes. There was over 10 gigawatts of power on the order of 10 gigawatts of power being emitted there. And, and on the far, Right in the slide, you can see uh, reflected light, scattered light from the ice grains that are the plumes of some of the plumes that are in, present in these tiger stripes. Next slide. Okay, so why does something that's sitting in the outer solar system, why does it appear so warm? How can it boil water out of its interior? And, um, that lies in the simple process of tidal heating, where there's a pull between other moons and Saturn on Enceladus that produce uh, viscous interactions that dissipate energy. Um, one of the important works here, theoretically, was the work by Chauvelet all in 2097, who showed that both the interior ice and the core could be heated and produce the models that indicated the type of energy dissipation that we see in the infrared. Next slide. What's the result of this tidal heating? Well, other measurements on board, gravity and liberation uh, measurements have told us about the internal structure. So many different instruments, remote sensing instruments participated in putting together this type of information, imaging and gravity measurements. So there's a core density that's rocky like 2300 to 2500 kilograms per meter cube with a core radius of somewhere on the order of 200 kilometers. And then above that, there's a water plus ice mantle that's about 50 kilometers thick. And an ice shell thickness that varies uh, between let's say uh, 25 and it thins out fairly of just a few kilometers in the Southern polar region. 
the mean thickness of the global ocean is 20 to 30 kilometers, but the importance is it is a global ocean and that we did not anticipate in any way. Next slide. So if we have a global ocean um, and we have material coming out of it, the next question is, what can we determine about, about the geochemistry of such an internal ocean? And what we were able to put together, and this is a kind of a summary, at which I'll go through, is salt and bicarbonates are measured in the ice grains. So that says it's probably interacting with rock. It's like the Earth's ocean. Uh, organic chemical compounds are measured in the grains and the uh, gases and the grains. There's silicon dioxide nanograins suggested, suggestive of internal hydrothermal systems. And there's H2 that's been measured. So let's go th through all of this. You can kind of see a cross-sectional cut there where there's a warming in the interior and then material that comes into the uh, water rock interactions that lead into the ocean and finally are uh, exhaust through the geysers and the plume. All right, next, next slide, please. All right, starting off with ice grains. So there, you can see there's a beautiful picture that Tack is famous at this point of looking back at um, Saturn, or actually towards the Earth, towards the sun and, and uh, eclipse. And you can see uh, the E-ring quite nicely in this picture, and the green air is pointing towards Enceladus, sitting right in the middle of the E-ring. So it's a beautiful picture. Um, but the information on this slide is what we're concentrating on at the moment. So there's three types of ice. There's a pure water ice that's been seen. This is a cosmic dust analyzer experiment now. Um, type one is the pure water ice. Type three is ice with approximately 1% salts. And then there's a type two, which is an organic bearing ice. And we'll talk in particular, since they're most interesting about three and two in that order. So next slide. Okay, so this is a, um, first on the left, you see a spectrum from the mass spectrometer uh, on board um, the CEA experiment. And you can see all the different, uh, the, so it, it acts by impacting these ice grains and breaking them into pieces. And then those pieces are detected by the mass spectrometer. And you can see all kinds of fragments here that indicate the composition, which uh, by the way, Frank Postberg has become an expert in trying to uh, use simulation experiments to determine exactly what's going on um, compositionally. But in this case, we can see over on the right-hand side that we have chloride salts, uh, both sodium and potassium. We have carbonate and bicarbonate. And we have a sal overall salinity that's about a quarter of that of the Earth's ocean. Next slide. In addition to the ice grains, I mentioned we have three sources, we have plumes. And we have three sources of the plume material, the plume vapors that we're looking at. We have the highly volatile material and nonpolar compounds that do not condense onto the ice as they move out. Uh, kind of subcategory of this, which is number two, is volatile compounds that condense during adiabatic cooling of the plume gas upon exit from the conduit. So as it, as it expands into the vacuum, it flash freezes some of the, these, and, but it makes very small grains and they're not differentiated in the neutral ion neutral mass spectrometer or the cosmic dust analyzer very well because they're very small nanogram size. The second type of com um, vapor that we can detect though is semi-volatile compounds that uh, at the plume conduit temperatures adhere to micron size ice grains seen by CDA. And are, they're seen also in lower um, uh, concentrations by INMS, the parts that don't absorb. So let's talk a little bit about these. Next slide, please. References are on the slides. So in terms of major composition, uh, we have water, we have CO2, we have methane, we have ammonia, and we have H2. And this gives you um, the range of 
values that we have a fairly high degree of confidence in. And um, it's due to image uh, in heterogeneity in the plume um, and just measurement uncertainty that leads to those error bars. But that's what we know. Uh, over on the left-hand side, you can also see some minor species that we are fairly certain are there. Uh, we've looked at them. There's ambiguity because of the overlap in some of the mass peaks and the low resolution of the mass spectrometry. But we also see even higher order compounds, which are difficult to deconvolve completely because of our mass resolution, but some of them likely uh, are oxygen and nitrogen bearing. So we'll come back to this subject a little bit later, but that gives you an idea of the, the major gas gases. Next slide. So this uh, sub, second category is interesting in its own right and can be detected both by INMS and CDA. And that's organics that can absorb onto the walls, of the grains at the coldest last 10 meters of the tiger stripes. It gets cold near the top, 195 degrees on that order. So this is work that Alexi Bouquet did uh, as a graduate student. It's a quite interesting piece of uh, work on absorption effects. If you go to the next slide, you can see the modeling that he actually did to try to help us understand that. So we took, if you look at the right-hand side, this is the gas mixture composition that we fed in as an input. And th these were not just total guesses. They were things we had an indication of that we might have, that might be present in the INMS measurements. So we've got acids, ketones, uh, alcohols, lots of different things uh, that are indicated here. And then over on the left-hand side, this is what comes out. So there's competition of this material to adsorb. There's differential adsorption onto this ice grain. And you can see that it preferentially absorbs the polar type compounds. The acids, the organic acids and the alcohols in particular. So there's a differentiation, pro differentiation process that's occurring. And this equilibration takes just a, a few seconds. And it's also independent or dependent on the size of the grain. So there's a, it's a complex, uh, it's complex to understand the plume from the outside, but it's also extremely convenient. Otherwise, you're going to need a submarine. So next slide. So we just talked about the uh, low mass molecular mass. So over on the um, right hand side of this slide is some of the attributes of those. There's a, not, a very nice paper by Kawaja and MNRAS that can give you the details of the CEA work to understand uh, what's on these grains. And it's reasonably consistent with what Alexi suggested would be true. Now I wanna switch though to the high molecular mass compounds because um, they're equally interesting and perhaps even more interesting in some respects. So next slide. Um, okay, so these are, these came out as probably particulates that uh, allowed a nucleation process of ice down deep. As the ice first went transitioned from liquid to uh, vapor in the at the top of the ocean. So you can see that due to hydrostatic balance, the water is further up in the channel because of the density, relative density of the liquid versus the ice. And at that interface boundary, some aerosol, some big um, organic solids came out and then they formed what we think had happened. And this is a work by Frank Postberg. They, they formed ice around them. Next slide will show you uh, the first indication that we had that this was true actually came from INMS. And that was because we varied the speed of the flybys because of the orbital geometry 
from about 7.7 .7 kilometers per second to 17.7 kilometers per second. So when we did a high velocity, very high velocity flyby, we started seeing a lot more, a particularly more high order uh, organic material that we could identify in the plume than at the low velocities. And this was the first hint that something was fragmenting, something was coming apart. So the figure on the right kind of shows that the carbon content of what we were seeing was going up that was being produced by fragmentation of heavier molecules. And at the same time, the oxygen content was going down because of the titanium uh, particles on the surface of, well, it, titanium was being sputtered off the interior surface of our mass spectrometer that um, actually ate the oxygen in the water and left H2. It allowed us to get the, uh, the hydrogen deuterium ratio of water and find out that it was cometary like, but uh, it also, as we've later on found, and if you go to the next slide, by analyzing the CDA data, which is shown here, we could see, look at those ice grains after the fact. And I think uh, Frank spent many years putting this together because it was only published near the end of the mission, after the mission in 2018 where we saw a lot of complexity in organics that it went up to 2000 U. And you can see in particular on the lower right side, this kind of um, polymer type pattern that occurs in the organics. And you can see in the upper right panel, the materials that were seen as fragments in the INMS mass spectrometer as well. One of them is benzene. So our spectrum at, at uh, our gas spectrum, which was really sputtered material from our in interior of our instrument and their spectrum, organic spectrum allowed quite a, a reasonable analysis given the, uh, that these instruments were never to design this to tell us about the organic content of this material. And you can read quite a bit about that in Frank Postberg's paper. Next slide. And this just is a further uh, indication of the, that region above 50 U in the INMS data was showing this, this, these rich, heavy organics, which were HMOC fragments and the plume gases existed at lower masses. All right, next slide. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some work that um, Christine Ray has just been doing, graduate student at UTSA, uh, who's working with Chris Klein and myself, looking at the formation of these complex organics on Enceladus. What, are they abiotic or biotic, or can we identify processes in particular that would uh, indicate how they could be abiotically formed? So if you go to the next slide, um, let's see the most, well, Here's the, okay, so if we start over on the left, we see, um, we see a stability field for the carbon type compounds. And you can see with certain H2 concentrations, which really represent oxidation state and certain pHs, you can get carrageens have a, they are thermodynamically stable. So they're, they're likely to, they are stable and can form. And these are these C numbers indicate different carrageens that we use as the uh, stand-in for uh, HMOC since we didn't know exactly what it is. And over on the right-hand side, you can see that Christine ran thousands of models uh, where she changed the, looked at the temperature and the starting rock composition, rock composition that varied in oxidation state and trying to see what would happen to the H2 and the pH and the fluid because they're important factors in the determine whether carrageens are formed or not. So if you go to the next slide, and this is a summary of work that will hopefully soon be published. You can see that uh, is a, this is a function of log of the activity of H2, which is really the concentration of H2. And as, as I say, represents oxidation state and a function of temperature, you can see which carrageens form and you can see that kind of uh, tannish 
fan that represents kerogen being formed across the whole temperature range in this particular case. And the blue band is the, is the um, constraint that comes from Cassini on the H2 that we think is present in the ocean. So, and, and over on the right-hand side, we can see the effects with pH and how the, the pH versus temperature uh, affects the growth of the carriages. In the final next slide, you'll see what the final conclusions are. And so if we put the constraints that came from CDA on the SiO2 formation and the constraints on the H2 that were measured by INMS, you can see that there's a block that's in green here of, of space where we have basically reduced rock material and temperatures above, let's say 180 degrees is the region in which we would expect this type of carriage and formation to be possible. And we do think those conditions are present in the interior of Enceladus. So this mechanism could potentially be one way which you could form those complex organics we saw. Okay, of course there are alternatives. Next slide. So the uh, next thing to talk about is what about the chemical energy from microbial metabolism? Because when we looked at H2, next slide please. Um, well, I'm going to digress a minute because I have a couple of slides on hydrothermal system that I go through real quickly because I mentioned this before. The indication of hydrothermal systems came from silicon dioxide nanoparticles that were measured by CDA by H2, which implied a hydrothermal source. And of course, the theoretical work about the heating of the rock was an important factor in making us think that hydrothermal systems at the uh, bottom of the are possible. Next slide. So this is the slide that shows that there's a certain band of temp, there's a certain temperature range in pH where the formation of the silica dioxide nanoparticles are possible. And that, in, and that was one of the ways at which we got at the values of pH, which we think are close to nine we have a range that's nine to 11, but we think it's you know, a fairly basic medium. And this is one of the ways that we got at that. And this is also one of the ways where we think there are elevated temperatures that are in the range that might form these carriages. Next slide. The other thing we did, and this is a complicated figure that I won't completely, I won't spend time to say, but we had a very complicated um, because of uh, contamination effects to measure H2 in the INMS instrument. But we did make a measurement of H2 on, on a design pass, which was E21, one of, one of the final fat passes. And if you go into the next slide, um, we were able to take that information and look at the um, relationship between H2, CO2, CH4, and CH4, and determined that there was a, a, po a positive chemical affinity. There was energy, chemical energy present in the ocean of Enceladus that would drive a process such as methanogenesis. And so this was quite exciting, telling us for the first time in a, in a foreign ocean or an alien ocean that we were going to, uh, we had chemical energy that might fuel life. The next slide is some work that Ruth did, which was a quite interesting follow-on. She went in search of such a meth methanogenic uh, microbe in the Earth's ocean and found one off the coast of Japan, which she could tell you quite a bit more about she and was able to show that it, she could sustain it under many of the conditions that would be present in the interior ocean of Enceladus. The only thing that was hard to match was the pH, but we don't know exactly the pH of the vents of the hydrothermal systems. So that's an open issue. Next slide. I want to talk a little bit 
in that now about what's, what else might be present? What else might, what other foods are present in this interior ocean? And what kind of other types of uh, metabolic processes could be supported? So first we needed to look for an oxidant and uh, in this potentially reduced environment. And that, there were two ways to go about this. This is again work that Christine Ray that is published in Icarus. Um, and that is, since we're in a radiation environment, we have electrons that hit the surface and they break apart the water and they can form O2 and H2O2, which over time uh, move through the surface with the ice and are deposited in the ocean. And you can see as a, as a function of time, the amount of moles that we think have delivered in the ocean. And it depends on the snow rate and the burial of that rate, uh, the burial rate um, in the Southern polar cap. Next slide. There is one also interior source and of uh, H2O2, um, hydrogen peroxide and O2 that comes from potassium decay, formation of argon 40 that's take, probably taking place in the interior ocean. We've, seen, we've modeled this and understood that this is in the case of the Earth's ocean, and we think it's quite likely that, the, that it's occurring uh, in the ocean of en Enceladus as well. And so this produces additional sources of um, oxidation. The next slide. So then we need water rock interactions. So we, we actually looked with, at uh, several different scenarios where there were no reductants present. So the oxygen, the oxygen is built up in the ocean. So if you see me at cases one, two, and three, another one where cases are uh, oxidants react with aquins, reductants only, a uh, situation where oxidants react with minerals directly at the seafloor. So she studied various scenarios in the ocean. And if you'll go to the next slide, we looked at various processes. So different um, known met metabolisms in the earth oceans that Julie Hubner gave us. And um, we, we can see that you can produce energy in many cases, methane oxidation, sulfide oxidation, iron sulfide oxidation, hydrogen oxidation. And those were just the aerobic processes and there were anaerobic processes as well. They all produced uh, energy, uh, power that could produce cells uh, and enough to, to sustain life but the dominant source that we, we concluded was, to, uh, was actually methanogenesis, which is what we saw first. So there's certainly the potential of, there's chemical energy in this ocean that can support things. Next slide. So this kind of, I mean, as you can see, we, we placed, there's a very uh, interesting set of data. It's not, conclusive, it's highly suggestive, it begs for a mission to go back. And this is one of those missions that was studied by a group um, Shannon McKenzie led in Celadus Orbilander, where it would both have both a um, orbiter and a landing element that went to look for um, life in the Enceladus ocean and it had a couple of high resolution mass spectrometers. It had selective, uh, it had electrophoresis. It had a nanopore sequencer, which is effectively a DNA sequencer. It has quite a complement of instruments that could be um, sent for future studies. And that would be an interesting thing for us to do in the future. I hope it happens. And let me, and let me take the remaining time though to go to the next slide and uh, talk a little bit about the next step, which is closer at hand, which is going using Clipper. Uh, and in particular, I want to concentrate a little bit on the mass specs instrument, which is a very high mass resolution instrument, a very sensitive instrument that hopefully can give 
answered these questions in a different way. So uh, next slide. So one of the things, uh, another thing that uh, Christine has worked on is to try to understand, since we know so little about Europa, really from an in situ point of view, almost nothing from a mass spectrometry point of view, um, modeling the, the volatile composition and trying to understand what would be the predominant volatile species we might, what we might expect to see and what we can learn from that when we see them. Next slide. So again, we are looking at a whole range of oxidation states, temperatures, and pHs, and trying to understand under those different conditions exactly what ratios one might anticipate. So many, many models have been run to, to produce this material. And in the next slide, Christine shows a kind of new way of presenting that. So each one of these dots on this panel, on these panels, represent a different model run. And it, and it shows you, actually, and this is just for CH4, but we do it for the other volatiles as well, where the blue lines indicate our sampling of the space. So the first one is the total car, um, carbon content, the first column, the second one is temperature, the third is oxidation state, and the fourth is pH. And so we, we have looked at the, we have categorized many myth, many, uh, what different conditions would uh, show in terms of volatile ratios and, and the hopes that we can turn and deter, use those volatile ratios to tell something about what's going on in the interior ocean when we get there. Next slide. Okay, so one other thing to note here, and this will be the uh, last thing that I talk about, is that we need to use organic, organic molecules are really our friend in this particular case at Europa, because some of the volatiles uh, are complicated by the fact that we're in a high radiation environment. So we, we anticipate that if we see H2, that it's coming from radiolysis of the water ice on the surface. And it's not necessarily coming from some kind of high interior hydrothermal system. So we had to get much more imaginative uh, with this experiment and exactly how we tested the conditions of the ocean. And we were, we've used the works that uh, have been that um, have been going on for many, many years uh, by Everett Shop to try to get at some of these things. And so one of the things we're using is ratios of certain organics that we know have interchange reactions. This is an example, ethane and ethylene. If we go to the next slide, you can see that for different ratios uh, indicate a different sets of conditions, temperature and log of the H2 fugacity, which is really the oxidation state. So if we see certain ratios of these two materials, then we can we at least have a line that indicates we're in a temperature oxidation space this might occur. If we go to the next slide, then if we can combine that information with the volatile information that we've obtained that we, we talked about, those volatile ratios, then we, can, we have another line that indicates how that ratio varies as a function of oxidation state and temperature. And those will cross at some point. And with that crossing point is likely going to tell us about the source temperature and the oxidation state of the regions where those materials are formed in the ocean. And it is going to tell us a lot of, a lot of what we want to know about the habit, habitability of the interior ocean. And this is, this is predicated that we get some of the material oozing out. It doesn't have to be a huge plume, but if that material is coming out of the interior, we hope can hopefully can interpret something about the characteristics of the interior ocean. Next slide. So this is a this is just a summary of, from the Europa mass specs point of view and showing you and just 
reiterating that there, there's lots of organics that we've seen in the outer solar system. This is a figure over on the right hand side. That's a whole other talk. But um, this whole process of looking at different organics ratios like ethane and ethanol over on the left hand side and propanol and acetone give us these different crossing points and they tell us not only about the conditions where these were formed but they also as they leach into the ocean can tell us about what free energy might be present so if there's food available we, we would be able to determine that food for microbes we'll be able to turn determine that by looking at a lot of these crossing points of these of these ratios of organic compounds and volatiles. Next slide. And one final thing is a direct search for the evidence of life. And this is work that Tara Salter has done with Mark Sefton at Imperial College. Next slide. Here she looked at a whole series of bacteria and archaea in the lab. And she did pyrolysis GCMS on that. And then that kind of simulates what the impacts plus the um, mass uh, determination, the mass spectrometer can tell us. So if you look at the top panel on the left-hand side, you see the pyrolysis GCMS data from that. And then she was able from that to put together a simulated mass spectrum that we would see. So she's done this for several, you can see cyanobacteria, you can see several things that she's done. And she's, this work is continuing where we're trying to understand exactly uh, what signatures, uh, fragment signatures might be representative of potential biology. And go to the next slide. And this is just a table that indicates four different um, compound types, the fragment ions we would be looking at and their possible origin, whether they be carbohydrates, lipids, or proteins, amino acids. This is work that uh, has been going on many years in Mark Sefton's laboratory, and, and it's uh, culminating some very interesting possibilities for the Clipper mission. Next slide. Okay, conclusions, and I won't bother to read these because I think I'm a little bit over, but um, I'll just say Enceladus has many of the desired elements of habitability, and we wait to see what Europa may hold for us. Thanks. <laughs>